Good morning. So today is daylight savings time. I get the choice of giving you a message on the day after you lost an hour of sleep. So I have a request. Everybody's sleepy. If you start to snore, please do so quietly. That's all I ask. So, but there's some good things about daylight savings time, right? As we spring forward, you get a few days of being sleepy. It brings longer sunny days, right? The days are getting longer, warmer. Soon we'll be spring, summer. Each summer we celebrate July 4th. And July 4th is the time to celebrate independence. Among the hot dogs, the hamburgers, and the fireworks of July 4th, one thing that many people forget is what it took to get independence. It took a war. That war, the bombs bursting in the air, that's sung about in our national anthem. And what the fireworks on the 4th of July represent. And today, I'm not going to go into a history lesson about American Revolutionary War, but I do want to talk about war and peace. I think that's something that's probably on a lot of our minds right now. And not the book by Leo Tolstoy, The Concepts of War and Peace. Now, as a provision, there's a lot to talk about. We only got a little bit of time, so we're going to oversimplify some things today, so bear with me. Have you ever heard the phrase, Turn your swords into plowshares. Well, first off, let's look at literally what does this mean? That's a sword. And this little part right here is called the plowshare on the end. It's that sharp point that cuts into the ground. That's an old time plowshare. But the newer ones, you can't really tell what is a plow and what isn't. They're so big they can actually swipe a field in a few strokes and have it plowed. But Basically, it's a part of agriculture. When you hear the phrase, swords in the plowshares, imagine an instrument of war turned to an instrument of productive agriculture, something to feed you. What comes to your mind? What images do that evoke? It's peace, right? And that's nice imagery. It's powerful. It's appealing. The imagery is used in lots of places, too. United States. We've actually got a famous program called the Plowshare Program. Now, this is interesting. Remember how we built nuclear bombs? Blow up entire cities with one spot? But they decided, hey, let's see if we can use that for some good. It was a good intention. And actually, if you read the, um, the program for it, it literally quotes the book of Isaiah in the program. But as you can tell, the effects of radiation, how long it lasts. If you're mining for minerals, you don't want to vaporize them. You want to actually pull them out of the ground. So it didn't go very far. But it was a good intention. Has anybody ever seen this statue before? This one? A few of you have. It's in New York City. It's right out that building with all the flags called the United Nations. And this statue is called Beating Swords in the Plowshares. Now this, United Nations is a secular group, built up of many of the nations of the world, and they have this right outside. Now, there's even artwork like this one. It's kind of a funky piece of art. If you can see, they got swords, they're sort of melted into a plowshare. It's artistic, but hey, it shows up. And this, this is actually a trophy. This is actually from a reformation movement. And it actually, if you can see, it actually has Isaiah quoted on the front of it. So, where does this phrase come from? And what does it really mean? Well, as we've mentioned, and as you're looking on the screen, it's a biblical phrase, and it's found in a few different places in the Bible. First two are nearly identical. The third one's a slight variation. So let's look at those. If you would turn me to Isaiah 2, verse 4. Isaiah 2, verse 4. These are the two nearly identical versions. Isaiah 2, 4 reads, He shall judge the nations, judge between the nations, and rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And the second reference, nearly identical. Let's turn to Micah. Micah 4, 3. Micah 4.3 reads, He shall 
Judge between many peoples, and rebuke strong nations afar off. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And notice that last phrase. Neither shall they learn war anymore. Lasting peace. That's nice, right? That would be awesome if we had that. And I believe that's why this imagery is so popular, because it's so appealing. But there's a third variation to this. Everybody turn to Joel 3.10, and let's look at what the third variation is. Joel 3.10 is a slightly different take. Joel 3.10 reads, Beat your plowshares and the swords, your pruning hooks and the spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. War, get ready. It's a different take, right? Turn those plowshares and pruning hooks back into weapons. Even if you're weak, pretend you're strong because you got to fight. So we got two votes for peace, one vote for war. But we're reading the same book, right? It's the same Bible. So what does God want from us? To fight? To make peace? Well, let's take a closer look. And since we're in the war camp, let's... Take a closer look at that one first since we're already here. Let's go back up to Joel 3, verse 1. The very beginning. And this is a setting. Joel 3, verse 1 says, For behold, in those days and at that time, when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem. So this is what's happening. It's the end of captivity for the captives of Judah and Jerusalem. And next we'll read about the charges against the defendant. It's like a court case who happens to be pretty much everyone in the area who attacked Judah and Jerusalem. So let's go on to verse 2. Verse 2, it reads, I will also gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, and I will enter into judgment with them there on account of my people, my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations. They have also divided up my land. They have cast lots for my people, have given a boy as payment for a harlot, and sold a girl for wine that they may drink. Those charges are harsh. Those are some despicable people. And they're called to that valley for judgment. It gets worse. Read on to verse 4. Indeed, what have you to do with me, O Tyre and Sidon, and all the coast of Philistia? Will you retaliate against me? But if you retaliate against me, Swiftly and speedily, I will return your retaliation upon your head, because you have taken my silver and my gold, and you have carried into your temples my prized possessions. Also, the people of Judah and the people of Jerusalem you have sold to the Greeks, that you may remove them far from their borders. These folks got so carried away that they literally challenged God. <laughs> now, we know what happens when that goes on, right? We see what happens when people get so puffed up that they think they can take on God. Well, let's see what happens to these folks. Turn them down to verse 7. Behold, I will raise them out of the peace, out of the place to which you have sold them, and will turn your retaliation upon your own head. I will sell your sons and your daughters into the hand of the people of Judah, and they will sell them to the Sabaeans, to people afar off, for the Lord has spoken. Now watch this. Here's the part we read earlier. But now we have the context of the rest of the situation. The sin is being handed out by God on these very sinful people. Let's go on to verse 9. Proclaim this among the nations. Prepare for war. Wake up the mighty men. And let all I am strong. Assemble and come, all you nations, and gather together all around. Cause your mighty ones to come down there, O Lord. Let the nations be wakened and come to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. Put the sickle in, for the harvest is ripe. Come, go down. The wine press is full, the vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. This is God basically passing sentence on those folks. And if you think about it, it's actually a bit of a humorous invitation to war. 
It's like a 300-pound linebacker telling the store mannequin, get ready, I'm going to tackle you. These folks don't stand a chance against God. But that's what they're doing. They're basically calling God against them. And God's saying, you're hearing this acts, those things you did, if you live by violence, well, you're going to die by violence. God judging the sinner is the call to war in this verse. They've lived that life of violence, and it's time for them to die a violent death. So, that imagery is kind of scary and forbidden, right? Let's go back to those scenes of peace. Let's go back to Isaiah. Turn me to Isaiah 2, 1 through 6. And we'll read this all the way through again with. Isaiah 2, 1 through 6. Isaiah 2, begin to verse 1. The word that Isaiah, the son of Amoz, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow into it. Many people shall come and say, Come, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us His ways, and we shall walk in His paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and rebuke many people they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O oh, house of Jacob, come and let us walk in the light of the Lord. You have forsaken your people, the house of Jacob, because they are filled with eastern ways. They are soothsayers like the Philistines, and they are pleased with the children of the foreigners. So it starts good, but then it ends not so good. But notice some key words in here. Mountain of the Lord. Word of the Lord. Judge among the nations. Going to the seat of Jacob first. And the seat of Jacob refusing. Does that sound familiar? It does, doesn't it? In the second chapter of Daniel, the imagery of the mountain is used when Daniel's interpreting the dream of Nebuchadnezzar. That rock that destroys all the other empires during the time of the Roman Empire, that's Christ. And the kingdom we're part of right now. We read about the word of the Lord in John. Turn me to John 1, 14. John 1, 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So there's the word of the Lord. And there's lots of places that talk about this, but since we're in John, let's flip over a few chapters to John 5. John 5. Verse 21 through 22. Starting in verse 21, it reads, For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom He will. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. The Word of God, the Son of God, committing judgment, talking about Jesus. That's what Isaiah is talking about. When Jesus came, he brought a recipe for real, lasting peace between humans and other humans and between humans and God, which is probably the most important. It actually is the most important. If we had listened to what Jesus had said, the whole world, how different a place would we be in right now? What if the earth all listened to what he wanted him to say? Let's take a look at what that would look like. Let's turn to Acts 2, when the church first formed. Acts 2, starting in verse 44. And this is what things were like when the church first started, when people were actually committed to what God was saying to them. Acts 2, 44. And all that believed were together, and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added the church daily, such as should be saved. If we were in a state like God had intended for us to be, we really could turn those swords into plowshares. We could live at total peace with the rest of the world. And that is how God wants us to live. That's how he intended for us to live. 
So what happened? Why don't we? But do you remember what happened with that first close-knit gathering of folks? What crept in just a few short moments later? Shortly after it started, we got a lie. Ananias and Sapphira. I sold it for everything. Were you giving everything? Yeah, I sold it for everything. Really? They hit it back. They lied to God. Straight off the bat. A few seconds in. What happened in the Garden of Eden? Garden of Eden? You want this apple, don't you? I, no, that's, no, I don't want the apple. A lie started right away. Killed it. They were in peace. God was walking with them. We have God's recipe for peace. But as humans, we mess it up every time, right? And total peace is how we should live with one another. But thanks to sin, this world doesn't see more than a few brief periods of peace. Where do those wars and fights come from? This is not how God intends for us to live. How do we keep ending up in the middle of the wars and fights? Let's turn to James. James 4.1 Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires and pleasures that war in your members? We have a choice of total peace. Man kind of rejects it in this world. Sin causes conflict. We have a personal peace and be at peace with all that goes on in this world. But we have to wait until the next world in heaven for total peace all around us. So if this world only have fleeting periods of peace, what are we to do? Will there always be war, rumors of war, we have to deal with? And let's read the scripture that actually talks about that. It actually mentions those exact phrases. Let's turn to Mark 13, 7 through 8. And this is mentioned in both Mark and Matthew. We use the version from Mark. Mark 13, 7 through 8. Again, verse 7. But when you hear of wars and rumors of war, do not be troubled, for such things must happen. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be earthquakes in various places, and there will be famines and troubles. These are the beginning of sorrows. That's really bleak, right? If we keep reading both this version and the one in Matthew, just get worse. But let's rewind to the end of verse 7. Do not be troubled, for such things must happen, but the end is not yet. And that very first part, do not be troubled. Why? War is horrific. I haven't been in the military, but my dad and my uncle were both military. And my dad would even talk about this until we got to be adults. So I, I haven't been there, but I can tell you from what I've heard, that it's, it's not anything to play with. Why would we not be worried about that? But we got an instruction manual that tells us answers, right? Well, let's look for them. Let's turn to Psalm 46. This is our, our verse from this morning, what we've got in the bulletin. And I think this, we're going to read all the way through it because I think God says it better than anybody can. Psalm 46, 1 through 11. Beginning in verse 1. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Even though the earth be removed and the mountains be carried in the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling, there is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. The nations raised. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord. Who has made desolations in the earth? 
He makes war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. That's our answer. God is our refuge. God is our strength. God is with us. God is who wins the war. He's in, he is the one who's in control of what happens to us. And that phrase, therefore we will not fear, as long as we are close to God, Let's turn to Job. And Job's a cool guy. He's almost like Batman. But let's see what he says. Job 29. This is him recoursing, recounting some of the things that he did. He was considered a good man. Let's see how he summarizes the case of how he lived. Job 29, 1-5. through five. Let's start there. Starting in verse 1. Job further continued his discourse and said, Oh, thou were in as in months past, as in the days when God watched over me, when His lamp shone upon my head, and when by His light I walked through darkness, just as I was in the days of my prime, when the friendly counsel of God was over my tent, when the Almighty was yet with me, when my children were around me. Job struck, he stuck really close to God. He walked in His counsel. God watched over him, guided him through darkness, as long as Job was close to God, Job could do great things. Let's skip down to verse 11 and read about what Job actually did. And we start with how people view, or the earth viewed him because of what he does. Job 29, verse 11. When the ear heard, then it blessed me. When the eye saw, then it approved me. Because I delivered the poor who cried out, the fatherless and the one who had no helper. The blessings of a perishing man came upon me. And I caused the widow's heart to sing for joy. I put on righteousness, and it clothed me. My justice was like a robe and a turban. I was eyes to the blind. I was feet to the lame. I was a father of the poor. I searched out the case that I did not know. I broke the fangs of the wicked and plucked the victim from his teeth. Now notice that. Eyes of the blind, living the poor who cried out. Blessings of a perishing man, which means he was helping the, the perishing man. Notice the last verse 17. I broke the fangs of the wicked and plucked the victim from his teeth. Job was not afraid to stand up for those who needed to stand up for. Fangs of the wicked. I mean, that was a scary looking folks. That was not somebody to be messed with, but Job wasn't afraid. If we are staying close to God, should we be, close, should we be like Job and not afraid to fight for a just cause? Absolutely. It doesn't matter how scary the opponent is. We are simply fighting as directed as God wants to, to help those who are in need of help. God is bigger, stronger, and more fierce than anything that happens on this little rock rotating around the sun. And this boldness comes out to play with the Israelites. Let's go to Deuteronomy 20. Deuteronomy 20, 1 through 4. When you go out to battle against your enemies, and see horses and chariots and people more numerous than you. Do not be afraid of them, for the Lord your God is with you, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. So it shall be, when you are on the verge of a battle, that the priest shall approach and speak to the people, and he shall say to them, Hear, O Israel, today you are on the verge of battle with your enemies. Do not let your heart faint. Do not be afraid. And do not tremble or be terrified because of them. For the Lord your God is He who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. However, here's the trick. What if we're not close to God? What if we've been distant, fallen away, not right by His side? What if we've turned away from God? 
Should we worry about that fight? Well, what about Saul? Saul started out pretty good, right? He was prophesying with the prophets. He started out okay. He was anointed to be king over Israel. But he fell away from God. He feared popular opinion more than God's command. He didn't trust to stay close to God and his commands. And here's what happens to Saul. And this is when Saul's in trouble. 1 Samuel 28, 15 through 19. This is when the Philistines are coming up against him, and Saul's scared. He's worried. And he has every right to be. 1 Samuel 28, starting in verse 15. Now Samuel said to Saul, Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? And Saul answered, I am deeply distressed, for the Philistines make war against me, and God has departed from me. It does not answer me anymore, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore, I've called you, that you may reveal what, to me what I should do. And Samuel said, So why do you ask me, seeing the Lord has departed from you and become your enemy? And the Lord has done for himself as he spoke by me. The Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hand and given it to your neighbor, David, because you do not obey the voice of the Lord, nor execute his fierce wrath upon Amalek. Therefore, the Lord has done this thing to you this day. Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with you into the hand of the Philistines. And tomorrow, you and your sons will be with me. The Lord will also deliver the army of Israel into the hand of the Philistines. Now, Samuel was dead at this point. So where he was at, was dead. Samuel turned away from God. He'd made an enemy of God. There was no hope, no strength for him. He was not who won the war. So his hope was gone. Isaiah even mentions this also to the people of Israel. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. Isaiah 59, beginning of verse 1. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. God is perfectly capable of saving us. But if we live in sin, we have distance from him, he's not going to hear us calling out. And we should be calling out to God way before we get into times of trouble. Way before it started. If we're living right with God, staying close to Him, we can have no fear of facing whatever comes our way. No matter what the danger, no matter how fierce the enemy. Now, this is important. Should we pick fights unprovoked? No! First and foremost, very clear about this. First and foremost, God says we should be peacemakers above all. That is our main role. That's why He gave us the recipe. We are supposed to make peace with others. Can we always do that, though? Can we fight a righteous fight to help someone in need? Yes. Should we fight like Job and rescue the helpless from the things of the wicked? Yeah. No matter how scary it is, that's what God wants us to do. Should we attempt to do so without being right with God? No. That is suicide. That is the issue. If we're right with God, we can face anything that comes. And this little picture on the screen, does anybody know what that little animal is? That's a honey badger. Now, the trick to this is, it looks like the lion's just sitting there scared. But if you watch on to this, a little honey badger actually chases off the lion. A fierce little critter. <laughs> lion's ten times his size, but he has no fear. If we're with God, it doesn't matter what the odds are. If we're not with God... It also doesn't matter what the odds are because you're not going to win. In this world, 
especially right now, there's a potential for a massive war. There are people being attacked for no reason other than an ego of a maniac dictator. Would helping those people who are being attacked be a worthy fight? Yes. Are we, as a nation, close to God so we can have boldness and confidence in that fight? That's the crucial question. I'm not so sure. And if not, if we're not close to God, there isn't anything we can do. There's no way we can help because it's not us that's going to win that battle. We shouldn't even attempt anything on our own. If we are, though, if we do find our way back to God, then we could. We could help out others. Because it's not us who fights, but God. Now, we may not be able to answer for the whole nation. But we can answer for ourselves. As an individual, knowing that the fight may come to us, if the maniac goes further than what he is right now, or he gets too desperate. Is your heart close to God? Are you confident in the relationship with God and your walk with Him? Is He your refuge? Is He your strength? Do you have confidence in the face of the enemy? The equation works on an individual level as well as that of the country. As we show, we use example from the individual Job. As individuals, we all have a choice. Now, before more trouble starts, <laughs> it's a great time to think about our relationship to God. Doesn't mean trouble is going to come, but we live in this world. We know trouble comes on our personal level, on a geopolitical level. There's always something around the corner. And it's always a good time to say, are we where we need to be? The littlest things of the day to the biggest things of this world. It's what makes us through this life. It's the only thing that gets us through this life. We just have a, a good reason right now to do some introspection, <laughs> more than usual. But as individuals, we all have a choice. Now is a good time to think about relationship. If you'd like to make the choice, be baptized. Join God's kingdom. Experience the peace that only God can offer. And no matter what's going on in this world, we're still okay. No matter how much the storms rage and the sea boils, we'll make it through because we have God. If you'd like to come and have a part of that peace, if you have anything that you need from the church, please let us know as we stand and we sing. Thank you.